Hello, in this lecture for today we are going to be looking at the development of calligraphy during the Six Dynasties. Now the Six Dynasties, as you might remember from looking at Buddhism last week, is a long period of chaotic history in China from the 4th to the about the uh, beginning of the 9th century. So we're going to look at a couple of calligraphers who emerge early in the Six Dynasties period who are very influential on the later development of calligraphy in China. Um, there are some basic technical things I want you to understand about the creation of calligraphy and some basic sort of concepts about calligraphy that we're going to start with this week. This lecture won't be that long, but there is a lot of stuff for you to read and watch this week, and so I'm going to kind of just limit it to one lecture so you can do the exam and do all that kind of stuff. Uh, but I do want to get started on thinking about the calligraphy, which is one of the three treasures in Chinese culture, so calligraphy, painting, and poetry, which we haven't talked about yet too much. We've been looking at the sort of earlier periods in Chinese history, looking at the other remains of, of uh, the culture, and now we're getting into the first surviving examples of calligraphy, and then also some political and social developments that make calligraphy come to the forefront as a really important part of Chinese culture. Here I'm showing you the four basic kinds of or styles of calligraphy that are used in China in the Six Dynasties period. There are a number of reasons why a person might write. One of the primary reasons in the Six Dynasties period is to write official documents. And a lot of times these official documents are not only things that are written either on strips of bamboo or on uh, long pieces of silk or paper, but oftentimes these are also carved into big flat pieces of stone uh, in order to put up in various parts of the kingdom um, information, you know, laws, um, commemorations of events, things like that. And so we have um, a couple of different styles of script or a couple of different styles of, of calligraphy that develop in this period for different purposes. On the left is the earliest example or the earliest type of of script writing that or of, of character that comes out of uh, these developments and that is the so-called seal script. It's very linear. All the lines are pretty much the same thickness as one another and very regular the characters all of a similar shape or similar size so that you can easily incise these characters into a piece of stone right the next style that develops which becomes prominent in this period is the so-called clerical style with the clerical style you can probably see a little bit more variation in the thickness of lines but here still everything's very regular everything's very orderly the character individual strokes of each character are very easily legible this is also a style that is popular for inscriptions on steely as well as for uh, writing the regular style is a more handwriting friendly style that develops sometime during the six dynasties period records are kept uh, and as I think I've mentioned before as the empire grows, one of the important components of Chinese government is not only the aristocratic families who are related to the emperor, but also the bureaucrats, the high-level bureaucrats who know history, who know Chinese philosophy, or excuse me, Confucian philosophy, who know Taoist philosophy, and they need to be able to read a lot of texts in order to study to pass the exam so they become can become bureaucrats and so they're also the people who will record laws and write histories and write treatises on Confucian thought and things like that and that is when you get the development of the regular style that is a more handwriting friendly style as opposed to chiseling in stone and then is you know available for the use of it still remains legible and is very um, f useful for record keeping the last style to develop develops during the six dynasties the six dynasties as i said is this period of political turmoil and what what happens is as 
different competing kings and regional empires take control as dynasties fall, people who are associated with the bureaucracy of that dynasty might find themselves suddenly out of work. They might find themselves needing to leave the capital because they're associated with the previous regime and they're not wanted anymore. They might find themselves in retirement or even in hiding. And this is something that starts to happen and becomes a pattern that we'll see again and again throughout the history of China. When that happens, one of the things that um, scholars do in response is they start to become more individualized. They start to have a kind of personal and public persona that are two different things. And they begin to turn to the consolations of philosophy, of writing poetry, of discussing things with their friends, of having a learned society together. And they start in the Six Dynasties period, this is when you start to see the development of a real emphasis on the notion of an individual style of calligraphy that can be used to express the inner feelings and thoughts of one of these scholar officials. In fact, this group of scholar officials will get the nickname the literati, the literati, the literate educated classes, the creative thinker class. We don't necessarily have a literati in our society, but that's the sort of, uh, we have the glitterati, right? The, the famous people. But I mean, this is the, um, this is the group that is going to be responsible for a lot of the calligraphy and painting that we will see in the next couple of weeks. So here you can see I've got the four basic styles of, of handwrite or of, um, of writing script or of creating Chinese characters from the oldest to the newest, from the most <clears throat> sort of official and um, legible and impersonal to the most personal. And I want to look at a couple of things here today to just kind of get ourselves oriented to and starting to think about some of the big issues with the development of calligraphy and then calligraphy, because it is the basis for it, is how poetry is manifest, the relationship between calligraphy and poetry. And because calligraphy and painting are done with the exact same materials, the same brush, the same ink, the same paper or silk, calligraphy and painting and poetry become all really intimately intertwined. Oh, and here's a close-up of clerical and regular scripts. And as I was saying before, um, as the as calligraphy develops, the font, font style, if you will, becomes more friendly to personal expression, and um, less and more individualized as time goes on. And that's something that's happening between the seal and the um, cursive script. But here, in these two intermediary stages, you can see that um, the the development of a kind of um, room for personal expression. Here I'm just showing you two people at work on calligraphy. There's just an anonymous young guy writing regular script and then cursive script that I was the last to develop, the one that is the most free form and individual. That's C.C. Wong, who's an <clears throat> important calligrapher in the 20th century. There is actually footage of him writing that I want you to watch this week and to think about the way that the um, express or the the way that the physical movements that create calligraphy are recorded by the um, ink and the brush okay well we'll get back into that a little bit more and then there's a lot to be said about this also in the um, Richard Barnhart article about the inner world of the brush the <clears throat> first famous calligraphers of Chinese history emerge in the six dynasties period and they are a father and son pair known as Double Wong or the Two Wongs, Wong Er, Double Wong, or the Two Wongs. This is the father here, Wang Sushu, who is, a, let's see, yeah, alive in the mid-fourth century, is an important bureaucrat in the Eastern Jin Dynasty government, and uh, as he gets to be an older guy, he becomes really well known as a really, really accomplished and very um, highly respected calligrapher. This is his most famous piece. It is a poem that is 
that is um, a preface to a collection of poems that he and his friends wrote after a party. Uh, so let's see, the preface to the Orchid Pavilion Manuscript. This preface, and actually there's a translation of the preface online that I've got linked from Blackboard for you to read, talks about how he and his friends gathered together for a mid-spring festival. And they were thinking about, he's sort of feeling melancholy because he's thinking about the passage of the years. And he's thinking about how centuries from now, people will be reading this poem the way that I am reading the poems of the ancients and thinking about them being dead for centuries. Uh, this gathering that he had at the Orchid Pavilion was where he and his friends, who were all scholar officials, who were all high-level bureaucrats in the court, were composing poetry and drinking wine. And they were, in fact, playing a drinking game. They had a uh, servant standing upstream from the Orchid Pavilion floating cups of wine down the stream toward the Orchid Pavilion. Once your, cu once your cup was let go into the stream, you had to start composing a poem. If you were not finished with composing and writing your poem by the time the, the wine cup reached the Orchid Pavilion, you lost and you had to drink your wine. Now, this is a common motif, by the way, in the, um, the development of the scholar official sort of um, archetype, that the scholar official retreats from official business to his private estate somewhere in the country to get away from the pressures of the, the job that he has, or to get away from political turmoil, or to get out of the way of a new dynasty coming in. And at their private retreat, they can celebrate and enjoy the fruits of their learning, beautiful calligraphy, composing poetry. And drunkenness often features in the um, creation of these poems and the creation of calligraphy in this period because getting a little bit of a buzz on was a way to let your inhibitions go and create, you know, let the creative juices flow, basically. And so this is something you'll often see as a motif in poetry and paintings of scholars is, um, you know, holding up a toast with a cup of wine or getting a little bit um, tipsy in order to unleash the forces, you know, the individual creative forces inside you. Wang Sizhu is particularly revered for being an archetype of this scholar official, and we'll meet other archetypes of this kind of reclusive scholar official when we look at painting in the Six Dynasties. Uh, but he's particularly revered for having been one of the first people to do this, as well as, to, as for being a master calligrapher whose work is very expressive of him as an individual and not just conforming to some rigid standard as would clerical script. The reason that people felt that they could feel his expression of personality in his calligraphy has to do with the way calligraphy is created. And I've got a couple videos for you to watch uh, in Blackboard this week that show you a little bit about how calligraphy is done. And what I want you to think about as you're watching them and as you're watching C.C. Wong and then this other anonymous guy that I've got painting, or excuse me, doing calligraphy, if you've ever done watercolor using a brush, the, that is essentially the kind of material that is being used to make calligraphy in ancient China on silk or on paper. You have an ink that is made, you get an ink stone that's a basically pressed, sort of compressed soot. Um, you scrape off a little bit of that ink pigment, you mix it with water, you dip your brush in the water, and then you begin to write your calligraphy. The look of the calligraphy will vary depending on how wet or dry the brush is, depending on how much pressure you exert with the brush, depending on whether you just barely graze the surface with the very tip end of the brush or whether you lay the entire brush head flat down on the piece of paper and make a thick dark line. It will depend on whether you make a very dense ink or an ink that's fairly watery. It will depend upon how slowly you draw the character, the individual strokes of the character. Because the brush is so sensitive and because the, the, the process is so sensitive to the motion of your hand, to the position of your hand, to the quickness or slowness of your stroke, 
And because if you were literate in Chinese you and knew how to write in Chinese, you would be almost like a muscle memory as looking at a piece of calligraphy. You could feel it. You could feel whether this was a quick and angry stroke or whether this was a very delicately, thoughtfully placed stroke. You could feel almost just by looking the way that an individual character is created. So that's part of what made a calligraphy such an appealing um, art and what made Wang Shu's calligraphy so appealing is that there is a great deal of individual expression in his characters. You can just see it in this little screenshot here where you've got some characters that are clearly <clears throat> very thick and very quickly laid down, some characters that are much more delicately inscribed, some that are clearly a wet brush, some where the brush has gotten dry and there's a little bit of a scratchy texture to the stroke. And so He's gone from <clears throat> just regular script that you would use if you were, you know, recording stuff for the emperor to a more expressive and personal sort of calligraphy. And in fact, the word for calligraphy in Chinese translates to English as heart print or mind print, with the idea being that what you have on the page is essentially a transmission directly from the brain or through the heart through your core, out your arm, onto the into the brush, and onto the page. Okay, let me show you a full view of Wang Sijiu's um, Orchid Pavilion manuscript. This is the full manuscript, okay? That uh, just of the Orchid Pavilion preface. This is the poem where um, Wang Sijiu says, "You know, this is I gathered with my friends on this day in 353 A.D." Although he didn't call it 353 A.D., he had a you know that's the equivalent in English. Um, I gathered with my friends, we were toasting the beautiful weather, enjoying the scenery, thinking about how quickly life passes and having this kind of beautiful and melancholy experience. So there you can see the variations in the characters, the variations in the brush strokes. Those little red stamps that you see all over this manuscript are actually the signatures of people who have viewed the Orchid Pavilion manuscript. This is something that is just not done in Western art, but is a hugely important part of calligraphy and painting in China. A particularly treasured piece of calligraphy, like the Orchid Pavilion manuscript, would often be copied by later calligraphers who wanted to learn, practice from the masters and learn from the masters. So one thing that happened with the Orchid Pavilion is there were copies made of it um, by individual <clears throat> scholars who were studying Wang Sishu's calligraphy. Um, and he's really, really, I mean, so revered in China. He's like the Leonardo of calligraphy that, I mean, lots of people would have been copying after his original Orchid Pavilion manuscript. Another thing that would happen is later owners of the manuscript or friends of the original artist or even people a thousand years later who had this in their collection would at some point, I mean they didn't have these things on full view, it's a long hand scroll that would normally be rolled up and put away. You might decide you're going to on a Friday evening enjoy some calligraphy. I think I'll get out my copy of Wang Sushu's Orchid Pavilion manuscript and take a look at it while I drink a glass of wine. And then as you're looking at it and admiring the calligraphy and trying to kind of get the, you know, um, communication across the centuries as you think about what it felt like to write this piece of calligraphy and what Wang Sushu must have been feeling, you might be moved to put your own signature in the form of a stamp using the seal script, um, which is the way that people sign documents, it's the way they sign paintings, it's the way they signed everything, um, your official signature or stamp. You might be moved to find an aesthetically pleasing place in which to add your stamp. This would tell later viewers that you had been there, that you had read this manuscript, that you had enjoyed it and valued it. And in a way, it becomes a kind of tool for art historians to know things like who owned particular pieces, who looked at them, who liked the uh, particular manuscript or image. Um, that people did this with paintings, too. Um, this is the kind of thing that I just think we, we wouldn't think of doing in the West, but you have to understand that calligraphy and the training that goes into calligraphy and the idea that you could get in touch with your ancestors through calligraphy like this, um, 
those are all, you know, sort of solidly within the traditions that we've already been looking at and thinking about in Chinese culture. There's a kind of Confucian element here, too, of paying respects to your elders, you know, by paying homage to them in things like this. I should mention to you that the Orchid Pavilion manuscript that we have is not, as far as we know, the original one that belonged to that was created by Wang Suzhou. It's actually a copy, thought to be a fairly faithful copy, done in the 8th or 9th century in the Tang Dynasty. Um, there is an early Tang emperor who was a patron and connoisseur of calligraphy who loved the Orchid Pavilion manuscript so much, the original one by Wang Suzhou from the 4th century, that he had it buried with him when he died. So um, that's in the historical record. So as far as we know, this is not the original manuscript. It is a copy from later on, but one that is thought to preserve the look of the original pretty well. Copying also does not have a stigma in China the, in this period, the, and really for most of the history of Chinese art, the way that it might in the West. Because again, you're talking about lineage, you're talking about respect for the elders, you're talking about tradition. It's a very Confucian kind of model for how one might create art. And even though there's this heavy emphasis on the idea of individuality, especially as calligraphy develops later on, one of the ways you learn to be an individual is by copying the expressive um, style of another and then, you know, kind of learning from that experience. So Wang, uh, Wang Suzhou was the father, and he had several sons, seven or eight sons. And his seventh son was this man, Wang Xianshu, who is from the late 4th century. Again, just one of the sons of Wang Xixi, Wang Xianshi, the other one of the two Wangs, the double Wangs, Wang Er. Here is um, Wang Xianshi's, it's just a letter about a duck's head pill. So he's writing to somebody saying, thank you for sending me this, it cured my headache, basically. Okay, <laughs> I mean, it's a short little note there in the center. Just take a look at this and tell me if you can see any changes between Wang Suzhou's and Wang Xianshu's calligraphy. And again, his calligraphy is only that, that two columns of, of characters in the very middle of this piece of, of silk. I guess you're not going to respond to me uh, in real time, but I think, I mean, what I want you to do is to see, to take a look at it. Can you see any changes or developments? You probably should be able to. This is a much more loose, a much more freely expressive, a much less easily legible, much more individualized and, and um, um, expressive approach even than Wang Suzhou's Orchid P Pavilion preface. Wang Xianshu is often thought to be the greater of the two Wangs. He took what his father did and built on it to push the use of calligraphy even farther towards personal expression, towards individuality, and away from regular bureaucratic script. There are lots of stories about Wang Xianshu as a child um, practicing his calligraphy one day, and uh, his father saw him and tried to take the brush out of his hand and found that he couldn't remove it because Wang Xianshu was grabbing onto it so hard. And that's when Wang Xuxu said, wow, my son is going to be a great calligrapher. Another time, there's a story that he was uh, writing calligraphy on the walls of his house and that Wang Xixi saw it and was happy because even though normally you don't want your kids writing on the walls of your house, he could see that the kid had a great gift for calligraphy. There's another story about him being asked as a child to write a piece of calligraphy for another famous calligrapher besides his father. And he accidentally dropped the brush on the, on the silk and made an ink blot and to cover up for his mistake, he quickly painted a cow, you know, to kind of cover up his mistake and then wrote a little piece of poetry about the cow. Um, so there's lots of sort of stories, maybe apocryphal, about Wang Xianshu and his incredible sort of prodigious gift with calligraphy. What he's celebrated for is what you can see here in this duck's head pill letter, where you have variations in texture, variations in thickness, variations in saturation of ink, and also a much looser approach to creating the individual characters. The char in fact, he developed a kind of style called running cursive, where um, in each individual character, you never lift the brush from the paper or the silk. 
so that the, the elements of the character are all connected and it allows for more free form kind of cursive looking script. There are two colophons, that is inscriptions, colophons, C-O-L-O-P-H-O-N-S. Two colophons written by different collectors on the duck's head pill letter, as well as several stamps placed carefully to enhance the overall look of the scroll by later collectors and viewers of the duck's head pill. This is thought by many to be um, an actual fourth century piece. It may or may not be, we're not exactly sure, but it is it is um, more likely than the Wang Sushir that I showed you earlier, which we know is probably ninth century. Anyway, later collectors writing on here, and you can see how their, their, curse, their excuse me, handwriting is much more neat and much more kind of regular than Wang Su Yan Shi's very expressive calligraphy. Um, writing in appreciation of what they see. Oh, and there is the duck's head pill, and there you can see that the darker section there on the right is probably the original. As time went on, more and more collectors would want to add their inscriptions and add their appreciations or just their seals. And so later on, more and more silk was added to the left. Um, Chinese, as you'll be reading in the next couple weeks, Chinese hand scrolls, just like Chinese writing goes from right to left, hand scrolls are read from right to left, whether they're calligraphy or painting. And so here, the farther left you get, the younger the... Um, the younger the silk is and the, the later the addition. So here I'm just showing you that to remind you these later inscriptions and later signatures are not thought of as detractions from but are actually considered enhancements of the original. They tell you a bit about who's owned it, who's looked at it, who's loved it, who respects Wang Xian Sure, it is a kind of mini art history all contained within the piece of calligraphy. Another way that Wang Xianxi and other people's calligraphy was spread is through the use of engraved copies, steely, that um, an artisan would be hired to chisel a copy of the original um, piece of calligraphy into um, by, and they literally sort of have to trace through the paper uh, and then chisel as chisel into the um, rock face the piece of calligraphy. A lot of famous calligraphers' works were preserved in this manner. And I mean, I think you can see how, sure, there's a pros uh, process of transference and a process by which there's, you know, translation or step after step, but this way... Um, Multiple people could come and learn the style of calligraphy of the great masters. So this is another Wang Xian Shi uh, piece of calligraphy. Here, what you're looking at is actually a rubbing taken off a steely that was engraved with his, uh, with this piece of this letter. And here again, you can really see in this steely or in this um, copy <coughs> the very. Um, free-flowing, connected nature of the different characters that he's creating and how, in some cases, he doesn't even lift the brush off the page and connects one character to another in this innovation known as running cursive script. Just a little bit later into the 5th century, we have this character who's related to the Wangs but is not one of the two Wangs, Wang Shi, who is a, a follower like many people of the two Wangs. If you look at this, I wonder if you can see, it should be jumping out at you, which one of the two Wangs was most influential for Wang Shi. Uh, this is a, uh, a letter and as you look at it you can see it's a very you can feel the energy. You can see how he's very insistent. So many of the characters have that very, very thick body that looks like he's really been, you know, insistently drawing the character and going on to the next. And then as he gets going and he gets thinking, uh, he's got these kind of squiggly marks. He's got some characters that are almost like just scratches on the page, very, very thin, as if he's, you know, been in a hurry and lifted the brush up quickly off the page. Very expressive of... 
whatever emotion it is that he's feeling at the time. And here again, you can see two very thin strips of inscription on either side of the main body of the image. Those are by later collectors who are writing commentary on this very famous piece of calligraphy. So very influenced by Wang Xianshi, who becomes the kind of, uh, you know, one of the big sages of calligraphy and even more even more important in a way than his father. The one-stroke cursive strip, writing the character in a single stroke, connecting between the characters, writing more for personal expression than for, for clerical legibility. <laughs>